Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Weatherstone Church. Would you stand with us?
feet, he has done great things. Come see what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Come on. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Jesus, and you're welcome in this place, Lord. Let's start by saying, Lord, you are welcome here.
Oh, Spirit of God, come like the dawn, open the heavens on us. We want to know you, we want to know you.
as we continue in attitude of worship, there was just some things in staff meeting that we were talking about. That we want our church, everyone here, to be so close and in tune with what God is doing that when he speaks, we know. And we're empowered to go and move forward in faith. So there's, there's things that we're going to do. We're going to just pause just a little bit longer to allow the Lord to just speak. So can you be available to that just right where you are? In this place, Lord, we want to know you. We want to be led by you, Lord Jesus. So we pause, Lord Jesus. We wait on you right now. We believe you're speaking to hearts, Lord Jesus. So Spirit of God, come. Father, we thank you for the words and the encouragement that was planted, Father. As we continue to learn and hear your voice, continue to, to draw us into your presence and, and prepare us to go out, Father God. How marvelous is your love that you would send your son to die in our place, Lord Jesus, before we even knew you, before we even knew the way. How amazing is your love for us, God. We thank you that we can be here together, that we can worship you, we can experience your presence. Lord, prepare the way as we continue to learn more about the book of James and our call to live out our faith. Lord, activate it inside of us, Lord. We're excited to hear from you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Welcome again to Weatherstone Church. We're excited to, to celebrate along with some families. Uh, we're doing some baby dedications in just a moment, so you guys can have a seat. If you're involved in the baby dedications, I want you to come up uh, on stage your right and begin to make your way up here as Pastor Brandon comes. Thanks. Too much fun. Hey, this is exciting, in case you're wondering. Like, I love uh, baby and child dedications because I have no idea what's about to happen. Um, this, these are the moments where uh, even as we have families uh, making their way on up, you're like, kids could start screaming. And it's the only time where I'm like, I actually hope that they do. Like, this is, let's, let's let it be fun. So I want to uh, just explain something to you a little bit as well, because depending on your faith background, this is going to look a little bit different for you than maybe what you're used to. Some of you may come from faith backgrounds where um, you... Uh, baptized babies, and, and uh, there's been a different kind of process for you. Here we do dedications, and this is the reason that we do. We'd love to talk to you more about it. Pastor Tori would even love to talk to you. This is Pastor Tori, our kids' pastor, as she leads them all out. Um, what we see in Scripture is we see even when Jesus, baby Jesus is born, that he's taken to the temple to be dedicated. And then what we see is as children 
grow older and as they begin to make a relationship and make a uh, decision for themselves to be baptized, we pray that they do that. We pray that every one of these children uh, do just that, that they grow in their relationship with Jesus and they uh, have this incredible, vibrant relationship with him. And at the time that they understand it, that they then um, make that decision for themselves as well. And we can't wait to be here when they're baptized. Uh, and we're excited for that. But that's why we dedicate babies here. Um, it's a little bit of a different process, but what we realize as parents is we realize that every child is a gift from God. And when we get that gift from God, we turn around and we say, God, we dedicate this child to you. Uh, it's an opportunity for parents to assume that responsibility, to realize how big of a deal that is, the, the role that you play in this. And um, we're just excited for what God is going to do. This is also the cutest this stage ever gets, in case you're wondering. No offense to myself or Pastor Jeremy, but this, you guys take the cake. Uh, I'm going to turn my back on you for a while. I know that that's not like what I'm supposed to do as a communicator, but they're cute. And I'm going to talk with them for just a minute. So you can join in on the conversation if you want. But um, I want to talk to to you guys as as family for a little bit. Um, I'm going to start with you dads. Um, This is a a big moment for you guys. Uh, I remember the first time I held my first child on a stage very similar to this. And a pastor turned around and looked at me and said, just so you know, when your child grows up and hears the term Father God, he looks at God through the eyes of his earthly father. There was a weight to that, but an incredible responsibility and understanding that I now get to be that picture. I know that none of us are perfect, but dads, if you're willing to do the best that you can to be that example for your child, would you just respond to me right now with a simple phrase, I will. Moms, uh, when we talk about love so much, um, we think of the, the care that we get from our mothers. We talk about God being love and then that example of, of what that is. It's impossible for us to, to take that outside of the eyes of our earthly mother. You have a huge role to play. You have a huge responsibility as, as you get to play that role in, in nurturing and growing your children in the ways of the Lord. Moms, if you commit to being that mom, would you respond with, I will? And then each of you have uh, some amazing kids here with you as well. And I think that there's this, this awesome moment as you as parents get to, get to come together. But realize that, that your children right now, um, God knows who they are. God has a huge plan for their lives. God has, uh, hi. <laughs> God, God has an amazing, amazing plan for their lives. And I think a lot of times we as parents, like we, we, hold our child for the first time and we have all these thoughts like they're going to be athletes and doctors and like all this amazing thing. But really our job as parents is to work in unison with God, with the Holy Spirit, to allow him to show us who he's created these children to be so that we can help cultivate them, not just to be what we want them to be, but to be who God has created them to be. If you both as parents will uh, work with God in that, to raise those children that way. Would you both respond with, we will? And this is where I get to turn back around to all of you guys as well. Um, uh, we, have, we have a role to play in this. We talk about being a church, and one of the things that we value here uh, is we value the next generation. And it's really fun when it's, when it's like on a sign on the wall, or it's really fun when we talk about it. But it's a complete another thing if, if we actually live it out. Please believe me, I believe that this is a church that values the next generation, that needs to value the next generation, but that's not just on me as the lead pastor to be like, this is what we should do, but it's really on all of us. That means that there may be some of you sitting here that, that you, you need to serve in kids ministry. You need to serve with youth on Wednesday nights. It's an amazing opportunity to be able to speak into and come alongside Parents, again, I remember growing up in church, the, the Sunday school lessons that I remember from Sunday school teachers that weren't my parents, but what they did is they came along and I was like, wait a second, my dad told me that, but I didn't want to listen to him because he's my dad. <laughs> but when they said it, it made sense. And I, it was because I was raised by incredible parents, but I was also raised by an incredible church. And that's on us. And if you're committed as a church body to being the church that values the next generation, um, that, that when kids start running through the lobby, we don't get angry at them. We 
get excited because God's got something in store for that little world changer. And if you're willing to be that church, would you just respond together and say, we will. We will. Now, this is usually a moment where we would have pastors hold your children. We won't do that right now. But we do have pastors with you. Um, they're just going to stand with you as a family and uh, pray with you as we pray a prayer of dedication over these incredible children. And if you're with me, if you would just even reach out a hand as we pray over uh, these kids and dedicate them to the Lord. God, we thank you so much for each and every family unit that's here. God, I thank you for the dads that you have strategically appointed, not just to, to be a dad, but to be a father, to be a mentor, to show their families what it means, how much you love us as our father. Lord God, that they would be able to be that example to their families. God, I pray for these moms here, that you would give them incredible strength, that you would give them incredible patience, that you would give them incredible wisdom to be able to, to speak into the lives of their children and their family, to raise them in the way that you would have them to be raised. And God, we pray for these kids right now. God, we know that there's an incredible, incredible blessing. Lord, your, your word in, in Ephesians 2.10 says that you begin work. We get to do it, but it's work that you've already begun and advanced for us. Right now, you've already started a plan for each and every one of these children. God, I pray right now that as, uh, as their families, as their parents, and even as their church, we help to see that plan to help guide them into what you would have them to do. So God, today, we realize these children are a gift from you. We dedicate them back to you. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen and amen. Can we give them a hand real fast? Right here? What a good-looking crew. We also we just want you to know we, um, we gifted them a Bible because we believe as a church that we come alongside families. Um, there's a Bible, that same Bible story is what Pastor Tori uses in uh, kids' church. That way you can continue to, to have that conversation throughout home and, and when, parent, or when kids come home and say, this is what we learned, uh, you can look it up and, and go right along with them. But we love you guys. We can't wait to see what God has in store uh, and uh, bless your children today. So if you guys want, you can start to head back this way. And Pastor Michelle... I think you are up. Well, good morning. I mean, talk about cuteness overload, so there's no pressure on me at all. It's okay, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Weatherstone Church, and welcome home. And we say that with great intention here because we know it's no accident that you're here with us this morning. So welcome home. If you're visiting with us for the first time, whether you're here in the auditorium or joining us online, I invite you to find a connection card. We would love to just get a little bit of information from you so that we can get some information to you. So those of you here in the auditorium, there's a box in the back as you leave. And if you're watching online, you'll see that there is um, a link in the description. So go ahead, take advantage of that. Flip side of our Connect card, there's room for a prayer request. And I don't know about you, but there's just so much going on right now in the world, everywhere. Um, and so we're humbled and honored and reminded as staff and pastors that we have the awesome opportunity to just join you in unity in prayer. So don't be shy or afraid to use that card. Um, take full advantage of that. Couple of quick announcements here before we get to Pastor Brandon's message, which I'm super excited about. Listen, speaking of ways to communicate, since we um, no longer are using a bulletin, our primary means of communication with you about everything that's happening here at Weatherstone is all electronic. So I encourage you, remind you to follow us on social media. We are sending out a weekly email, and if you're not receiving it, grab one of these cards, put your name and email on it. We'll make sure that you're getting that. We're not going to flood your inbox or anything scary like that, but we want to make sure you're equipped and that you know about all of the events and things that are happening here. Um, speaking of cool events happening here, I'm so excited we're back in the building on Wednesday nights, right? Core groups have started. It's not too late to get involved. So here in the building on Wednesday night, we have a full children's ministry. Our youth group is meeting. Rooted, a core group, and Sisterhood, the in-person session, is meeting here on Wednesday night. If you'd like more information about that, stop at the Connection Center. Pastor Brandon's going to head on up here. Before we do that, I just want to say thank you for your continued generosity in giving, your faithfulness in tithe and kingdom builders. Um, all glory to God, right? Even through a pandemic, we are continuing to be able to support every missionary that we ever had. You guys are faithful. We appreciate it. There's three safe, secure ways to give here in person. You can text or online. Thank you for being so attentive. Pastor Brandon. Too much fun. How you doing? 
I, do I need to ask again? I, I, I like, this is church. You could talk back. It's fine. Like, um, I, I don't want to just lecture because I didn't even like school. So um, we, can, we can make it a conversation. I have one more announcement for you that I, want, I wanted to give uh, to you today because of, I believe, its level of importance. Um, and that's because of this. Uh, next weekend, next Sunday night, we are going to have a worship night. And I, um, I want you all to put it on your calendar, and I would love for you to be there. And I think, I, first of all, I love worship nights. I think they're all super, super important. Uh, I believe that this worship night, I believe God is going to do something incredible. Um, there are, it's, it's kind of a, a call to prayer next weekend. Some ch- places are doing it on Saturday. We're doing ours on Sunday here. Uh, and I just believe that God's going to do something. Uh, and it's because if there's ever been a time that I feel like prayer is needed, um, it's in this season. And it's not just because of where we're at as a nation and as a country and the things that are coming up and elections and all of that that's going on. Um, I believe that it's bigger than that. Um, I know there's been a, a verse that has been shared a ton uh, recently uh, in Second Chronicles Second Chronicles 7, 14. How many of you guys have, have seen this verse? Let's throw it up here real fast. Um, how many of you have seen this verse on social media? It says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There's been a lot of people that have, have shared, and it's an incredible promise, incredible verse. What, what is, it's, it's amazing. But how many of you also looked at this verse for the first time, you were probably an English major or really liked it, and you saw this right here, and you were like, ooh, typo, they forgot to capitalize the I at the beginning of the sentence. Um, first of all, that's not actually a typo, because what this verse is, is it's actually the second half of a sentence. So we've been sharing this, which is incredible, it's an incredible promise, and I believe that, that we need more than ever for God to, to turn his face to us, and we need, we need to humble ourselves, we need to pray, we need to we need to turn back to him, repent of our wicked ways. But here's what God says first. He says, actually, um, usually when there's a promise, there's a sign that he will give us before, saying, hey, when you see this, this is what needs to happen. Listen to how, where it starts in verse 13. In verse 13, it actually, the whole sentence starts this way. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain. Let's pause for a moment because um, here, especially in our part of the world, I feel like we've gotten more rain in the last, like, summer than ever before. Like, it's been crazy. You have to, like, plan when you mow your lawn around when it's a swamp and when you can actually get through it. But what we do know about so much of the rest of the world is um, there's been a drought that's led to famine in a large portion of the world, to the point where the United Nations in April actually said the famine in 2020 2020 could actually get to their, quote, biblical proportions. All right? So, We know that that's there. Then it says, or command the locusts to devour the land. Has anyone ever seen the locusts that are currently like eating all of Africa right now? They're like the size of birds. It's kind of ridiculous and scary when you see pictures of it. And it says, or send a plague among my people that I feel like we've been living in for the last eight months. It says, when these signs happen, it's not just, man, 2020 is a rough year. It's literally God saying, when you see these things, then here comes the second half of the sentence. When you see that, but if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves when they pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven the incredible promise, will forgive their sin, and will heal the land. I don't think that this is a worship night that's just like, hey, it's September, we're getting back together. I think this is a strategic moment. And there's times and moments like this where we can, we can look at it and go, man, it'd be nice to have God's blessing and then move along our way. Or there's moments where we can stop and we can pause and we can realize what God is trying to tell us. And we can get on mission again and say, all right, God, we're ready for this. I believe that God will send revival, but here's the thing. We want revival to come, and we want it to look comfortable to us. Like, we want the Spirit to show up. We just don't really want to stop doing what we're currently doing. And there's moments where God is is so ready for revival that he has to send things to knock us off of our norm. And he says, but if you respond to those things like this, if you turn from your wicked ways, if you repent from those, if you turn your face back to me, I will heal your land. 
I will forgive your sin. And I believe that this weekend, next weekend, that we can spark something um, that is going to take off for the remainder of this year and last well beyond 2020. Um, And I believe, I I just in my spirit believe that it's going to start next weekend. So again, I, I, I ask you to be here. It's one of those things where it's like, I implore you, I legally can't require you to be here. But if I could, I totally would. Just know that. Know my heart on it. Because not just because it's like, hey, we're going to get back together, but I truly believe that God is going to do something and shift something in the atmosphere next weekend. And I believe that God's going to do something incredible. So uh, I, I, I do, I hope, I pray that you'll be here with me. Sound good? I will do the whole thing over again if I have to. Like, I got to, oh, it's the ski. Does that sound good? All right, let's do this. Hey, um, we're going to get into the book of James. Before that, I just want to call some people out because I love them and I love missionaries. Uh, Hannah and Nolan Tarantino are here with us uh, in the front row. You can't really see them. You can see the back of their heads. But um, they have been in France for the last few years. I've actually known them forever. I went on missions trips with Hannah when we were in high school together. Um, Known Nolan forever. Um, they are actually back raising funds for a little bit now and are headed to open uh, coffee shops to do ministry out of in Israel. Um, and it's awesome. So again, it's like coffee, ministry, Israel. Like we're, we're, I'm going to go hang out with them at some point. There'll be a team. If you guys love coffee and Israel and Jesus, like then we're in. So, uh, but I just want to love and honor them. They've been, we've been hanging out with them. They have four boys that are all the same ages as our four kids. So it's been like craziness at our house for a little bit, but uh, love you guys and so glad that you are here with us. Um, James, if you want to open up to James chapter one, that's where uh, we still are. We're a week in and we did not make it all the way through James chapter one last week, but let me quick recap until, and then today we're going to finish uh, chapter one. Chapter one, we learned a few things. We know that uh, the book of James is actually written to the church that has been scattered. So it's the church that right after Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen, um, the church there at that moment, finally like the first time that the the religious rulers get so angry with the church that they killed one of their leaders. So the stoning of Stephen, we read about that in Acts. It says at that moment, they dispersed. So they, 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 out of fear, had to leave the area. So all of these people are all over the place, living all over, Uh, probably in fear, probably in anger, uh, all that's happening. And this is who James is writing this book to. And the first thing he says to him is, hey, persevere, like persevere. In the midst of it, ask for wisdom. God will give you wisdom, but persevere uh, with with what's going on, all right? So that's where we were last week. It was a lot longer than that. So if you missed it, please go back and watch it online. Um, But where we pick up today is, is we start to realize now how we're supposed to live this life. It's not just persevere. Like, I feel like with last week, we, I definitely tried to give it more hope than just like, just hang on. It's not like God's up there like, hey, good luck down there. Like, I'll see you when you're here. Um, it's not exactly what it is when, when he's there, but we start to see what happens when we start to persevere because the chapter is not done yet. And we're going to pick up today in verse 19 of James chapter 1. So if you want to read along or it'll be on the screens with you as well. It says this. It says, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. They should be slow to speak and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. I just want to take a little break here. Like, I feel like we need to pause, take a deep breath. Um, Because what he starts here is he says, here's the deal. Um, Be quick to listen. It's actually how he starts. Be quick to listen. The word that's even here, he says, you know what? We should actually, we should be eager to listen. We should be eager to hear people. Not just like what they're saying, but a lot of times what they're saying is actually like there's, there's a heart issue that they're trying to communicate that's even deeper than that. So if we're not actually eager to listen, sometimes, sometimes I, just, this is my confession to you, sometimes I listen because I'm waiting for my turn to talk. <laughs> You're like, all right, I'm waiting for the break. So when you take a breath, I'm going to try and jump in there. This is not what James is saying. He's like, no, 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 be eager 
to listen. Our desire should be to hear people, to sit at a table and go, I just want to like, what's, what's, what are you thinking? What's on your heart? Not just what's there. Again, I, I started college as a, as, a, as a psychology major. And one of the things that they would say a lot is they would say, whatever symptom they come in with, um, know that there's a root issue. And you could put a Band-Aid on cancer, but know that you're not actually doing anything. So part of the reason that they, you, they try and get you to talk and ask questions is they're like, there's something deeper that is causing this. And this is what James is saying. He's like, be eager to listen. Be eager, like our desire when we sit down with somebody shouldn't just be to try and get as many words in as possible or find out like when we can do the back and forth, but it's literally to get to know people's heart. Be eager to listen, to sit at the table. And this even means people that maybe you don't agree with. Like, can I just say right now, like social media is full of people that have never read this verse right now. Don't worry, nobody in this room, I'm sure. Pause for that chuckle a little bit. I don't know that. I actually, I'm barely on social media, so I don't know what you post a lot of times. Here's the thing, though. Like, like I know that we live in, in a world that is so tense that we're, we're, I would say, more eager to argue right now than to actually listen. We're more eager to find out or to prove something wrong than we are to figure out not what they're saying, but why someone is saying what they're saying. Like, what, what is it that maybe... That, that has maybe happened to you or, or maybe something that, that is going on in your life or your experience that may be different than mine or maybe, a, a, maybe even a, an angle on a topic that I've never thought about. Like maybe that is possible that it's out there. But, but what James is saying is being, be eager to listen. Meet, meet, at the, meet at the table. It's an interesting, um, uh, interesting book, interesting read. I'm actually, um, I really like politics. I just, I, I like I don't know. I like, I like listening. I like, I like hearing different sides. And one of the things, um, another thing that I do is when I look for books to read, a lot of times what I'll do is I will, I will research people that I follow, like leaders or pastors, and I'll find out what they're reading or what their favorite books are, and that's what I'll read. And uh, a few years ago, um, there was a book that popped up on like three different people's lists, and I got it, and I read it. And it's actually, uh, it's an autobiography on Abraham Lincoln called Team of Rivals. All right, I just want to explain this book real quick. Um, what it was, and I didn't know this about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was one of four candidates for the Republican Party at the time um, for the presidential nod. The other three candidates all grew up in political homes on the East Coast, like they were groomed for the presidency. All right, so they literally, as they were campaigning, paid no attention to Abraham Lincoln because he was this gangly Southern Illinois guy that was like, whatever, podunk, he doesn't fit in this political world. We don't have to worry about him. The problem was the Republican convention that year was in Chicago. And all the Midwesterners were like, actually, we kind of like this guy. He's not polished, like whatever. So what happens is in that moment, he ends up getting the Republican nod um, for the election in 1860. Meanwhile, the other convention is happening. And at that convention, there's four people that are also running, okay? And when they hear that Abraham Lincoln is running, they're like, whoever gets this ticket is about to win because he is not like he's, there's no way he's qualified for this role. And if you know anything about the, that election, John Breckinridge ends up winning the nod um, from, that, from the Democratic Party. So they go head to head. And if you've ever like spent money, you know that Abraham Lincoln became the president, uh, right? <laughs> so here's the thing though, like this all is, is at the be very beginning of the book. Here's the part that you may not know. Um, this book is called Team of Rivals because when he became the president, he had to fill out his cabinet. His cabinet is made up of seven people. The seven people he named to his cabinet were the three Republicans that he beat and John Breckinridge and the three other Democratic candidates. So those are the, the, the four that are there. And what he did the very first day that they walk into this meeting, everyone else in the room felt that they were more qualified to sit in his chair than he was. And he sat down in the very first meeting and said, here's the deal, guys. <laughs> like, I realize that none of you like me. <laughs> like, none of, none of you think that I deserve to be here. None of you, every one of you thinks that you are more qualified to sit in this chair. But for me to lead this country for the next four years through the impending civil war that's about to happen, I have to, to be able to make the best decision for this country as a whole, I have to have your opinion at the table. 
I've got to hear what you have to say because you represent a portion of this country, whether it's a, a, whether it's a, a, a geographical group or a, a, a economic group, whatever it is, the reason that you are here is you represent something that I am not aware of and for me to make the best decision, I have to hear you. And it's an incredible book because the first part of it, they like have all these letters from these people <laughs> and, and they're like writing home going, this guy's ridiculous. I can't believe he's in this chair. He's going to be the worst president ever. And by the end of his term, every one of them is like, He's one of the most incredible leaders I've ever worked with. Not because he was like this incredibly strong leader. Not because he was, he was, but it wasn't because he just like forced his way through things. It was because he was eager to listen. He sat down at a table and said, hey guys, like for us to actually get, like to do the best possible thing. And what they talked about is they're like, there was so often that he wouldn't change his mind. Like he wasn't, like he didn't wash back and forth on it. But there was a moment of going, hey, he sees my side. Therefore, we're, we're good with this. First of all, I feel like this should be required reading for any politician right now in America. But even more so than that, it's easy for us to say, man, wouldn't it be nice if politicians did this? Can I just pause for a moment and say, I'm not talking to politicians right now. Can we as a church represent that? Can we sit down at a table even with people that, that may not agree with us and just say, hey, we're, we're here to listen. Like, we love you enough as a person that that even your opinion that may be different than mine, I still love you more than, than I care about opinions. Can we be people? This is what James is saying. Again, writing to people who have been displaced, they don't have a vote because they're not in their own country, so many of them. They don't have, uh, not that they had a vote then anyway, there wasn't a democracy, but, but they were there and he's still saying, hey, even though these, these are these people, be eager, eager to listen, desire to listen, be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. And when you do, um, don't, don't be angry. It's kind of amazing. You know what this sounds like? It sounds a lot like what Jesus said when he said, I have a new command to give you. In John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he says, I have a new command that I give you. Love one another. You should love each other. Like, love, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. So that people will know you by this, by the way that you love. When we look at our lives, people should know that we are Christ followers by the way that we love them. And I feel like what's, um, so, so absolutely, like, it's hard for us even to understand, like, what love means in, in our culture. I feel like we've kind of botched the word love in, in uh, the English language. Uh, we can use it for so many different things. Like, I love my wife, and I love my kids, and I love tacos. Like, it's just all the same word, completely different meaning, right? And what Jesus is saying here, when he's like, when, when, when you love people, they're going to know. Not just like them, not just like tacos love, but when you love love people, they're going to know says uh, in all of that and be slow to anger because it says in that in that passage it says um, because when you're slow to anger that ang- or human anger does not produce righteousness that God desires anger and threatening can actually change actions but it actually doesn't change anyone's heart and God doesn't like he's he's way less concerned with the external and more concerned with the internal so when we get angry people might be like intimidated like all right fine i'll do this but the moment that you leave they're like i'm not doing that again like forget that but when we actually have relationships the way that god and the way that james talks to us about here what happens is the righteousness that comes about that isn't an action or an attitude change it's literally a heart shift of going oh my word like they understand me and then they're we're allowed to to be able to speak into their life that's how we love and communicate with people and it continues on it says this in verse 22 back in james chapter 1 Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, this is kind of crazy in in this moment to, uh, I don't know, like the first time I read this, I was like, that's kind of weird. But it makes a whole lot of sense when you realize what James is saying here. First of all, he's saying, um, don't hear the word of God and then don't actually do anything about it. Because when you do, you're deceiving yourself. 
Because what happens is you feel good because you're like, yeah, I went to church. Like, I checked the box. Like, I'm, I'm, I did it. Like, I'm there. But you actually haven't changed any of your actions. Therefore, you're deceiving yourself. Here's what's interesting. Did you know that um, Satan, the enemy of God, is known as the father of lies? He's the great deceiver, some people will say. But when we come to church or when we read the word and we hear the word and we, we get into it, but we actually don't change our actions, do you realize that we're doing Satan's job for him? We're deceiving ourselves. We're, we feel good about ourselves, but we're not actually doing anything. I, I believe this today. I think that Satan is completely cool with a church that's packed on Sunday full of people that are stagnant on Monday. I think he's fine with that. It's like, you know what? Play the game. Like, I got, I got people I need to worry about. You guys are taking care of yourself. You're deceiving yourself because you're hearing the word, but it's not, you're not allowing it to change your life. And then he goes on, he says, but if you, if you read this, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror and then forgetting what you look like. Why is that? It's because this isn't just a historical document of really cool people. This is what we should look like. Like this, is, this, is, this isn't a historical book. This is a survival guide. When we follow this, we look like the people in this book. The mirror that we're looking into is scripture because this is how we were created to be. When I read through this, I'm like, man, this is awesome. Like, I want to be like King David. Like, I want to be like Paul. Like, I want to be, this is who I want to be. But when we read it, we realize that's who we're supposed to be. And when we read this and then we go and we aren't like this, it's like looking in the mirror and then forgetting who we're supposed to look like. It's like that moment, you ever watch an action movie and then like you dream that you're in the action movie, <laughs> like you're in it, and then you don't even have to be sleeping, you're just dreaming like every moment after that you're walking the dog and you're convinced that there's someone lurking behind a tree in your neighborhood, like right, you're, you're, at, you're at pizza ranch with your family, like scanning the room like Jason Bourne, you're ready to get jumped. Does anyone else do this? This is just, you ever walk into the post office and you see all the boxes there and you check your pockets like I might have a key, like you never know. And then when I open it, there's like 10 grand in cash, a passport from Germany, and a pistol. Then you're like, let's do this. Like, here we go. I guess, I guess I've been chosen in this moment, right? Like, we, we take that moment, and we start to put ourselves into the movie. Like, we want, we want that life. But here's what's crazy. When we read Scripture, that's what we're supposed to do. This is who we are. When we look at Scripture, it's a mirror of going, oh, my word, that's the life I get to live. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and active in me. Therefore, all of the things that I witness here, I then get to call, be called to go do. We're called to be people of action. And when, when we're, not, um, we're not active, when we're not doing what God has called us to do, we're actually deceiving ourselves. When we're not living this life, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. We're, we're checking boxes. We're feeling good about ourselves because we made it to church on Sunday. But we haven't actually moved forward. What we're supposed to do when we come together and we hear the word of God and we gather as a church and we dive into the word is we leave this place changed. And we leave this place fired up because we're like, man, here we go. Like, we're not, church isn't supposed to hang out in here. We're supposed to like bust through these doors on the way out going, let's go after this. Like, let's do it. Let's live this type of life. Reading scripture doesn't just show us who the heroes of the faith used to be. It shows us who we are supposed to be. And that's what we get to do. That's how we get to live. So le like, read it with excitement. But here's what else it says. Whoever looks intently, now jumping down to verse 25 as we're still going through James. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but instead doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. As again, we talked about Chronicles before. We love the blessing piece of it. We love the, they will be blessed when they do. But realize this, like action activates our blessing. The blessing comes on the other side of our obedience. We talk about faith that moves mountains, but first we need faith that moves us. And when faith moves us, then we get to be the people who move mountains. Do we have enough faith that says God's going to show up and I'm going to be the person, like I'm going to leave this place and I'm going to be who God called me to be and I'm going to be like biblical Jason Bourne today and I'm going like, to go into the, the, the streets and I'm going to go into work tomorrow or school tomorrow or neighborhood this afternoon, wherever it may be, and I'm going to be on mission with God and I'm going to be like this. That's what this book calls us to do. That's what we get to do through faith. And I love reading like, like Hebrews chapter 11. It's known as the faith chapter. If you have time later this afternoon, just read through it. It's all like 
by faith, this is what like Noah built an ark, even though he'd never seen rain. By faith, Abraham um, did, did this. By faith, and it goes through the Old Testament, just like some of these incredible people and all the things that they did by faith. And then it keeps going, and it's like, honestly, I don't even have time to list all the people, and it just starts listing people, like not even what they did, just like, what about this guy, and this guy, and this person, and this lady, and like, literally, I don't even have time to list them all. But then, is, if we look at, at the book of Hebrews, again, there's, there's no like, there's no chapter breaks in the original letter. It goes straight into chapter 12, and it says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, so they, literally, he's speaking as if all of these incredible heroes of the faith are around him in that moment. Like, these are the people that, like, these are my guys that are with me right now. Because if we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that's so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, it's a word we talked about last week, with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that is set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and consider him who endured such opposition for sinners so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Man, because all these people are around us, guess what we get to do? We get to walk in the victory that Jesus already gave us. Like, we don't leave here like, hey, good luck going to do something good this week. Like, come back together, and, and even if you're beat up, just limp your way back in, and it's going to be great. No, no, we walk in victory when we leave this place. Part of the reason that the enemy wants you to be stagnant is he realizes that the victory's already been won. He can't, he can't beat you. He can distract. He can try and, try and like get in your way, but he can't beat, he can't stop you. The only thing that can stop the church from moving forward is us looking at this book and leaving here not changed. Literally, the only thing that can stop the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ is if we don't carry it forward. We are called to be people of action. We are called to be people who, when we read this, we're like, awesome, where am I going this afternoon? Like, where, where am I going tomorrow? Like, let's, let's put this to practice. Don't leave it here on a Sunday morning, but let's go live a life that is exciting. Let's go live a life that is victorious through Jesus Christ. And before he ends the chapter, he says one last warning. He says, those who consider themselves, this is verses 26 and 27, who consider themselves religious, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. Their religion is worthless. But religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans, the widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It says again, it comes back to that moment, hey, watch your tongue. Be eager to listen. Be slow to speak, because when you leave this place, you, you have incredible strength. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have, you have the, the, the power of your tongue, knowing that you are created in the image of God. God spoke the earth into existence. Jesus spoke to sickness, and it was gone. Jesus spoke the demons, and they were gone. Jesus spoke to dead, and it became life. And you were created in the same image. And he says, here's the deal. Watch your tongue, because the tongue is going to have the power of life and death. But when you go from this place, go in strength. Church, here's the thing. We're going to end today um, a little bit different. We've been ending with worship, and we're going to I love this moment of just being able to respond. But we're going to take some extended time. And we're going to worship together. Because know this, I believe that you can move mountains. But before you can ever move mountains, you have to allow your faith and your God to move you. And for us to be on mission with him, we have to be commissioned by him. We have to be filled with his spirit, with his power, so that we can be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So we're going to take some time and we're going to sing, we're going to start with a song called Available. That, you know what, God, I'm available. And we're just going to sing two songs to end. But it's because I don't want to just send you from this place and go, hey, good luck. We'll see you next week. Which, by the way, I can't wait to see you next week. I can't wait to see what God is going to do in your lives. 
But it's not just about getting a couple of words from me that I read from scripture, but it's about understanding that you have the same access to the Holy Spirit as anyone else in this room. And when we respond to God in our lives, when we allow him to do what only he can do, then you're going to do what only you can do with him with you. So I'm going to ask you to do this. I want you to stand all across this place. And I want you just to, to hold your hands up. If you want to receive what God has for you, if you want to let go of what you're holding on to and receive the, the mission, the commission that God has in store for you so that you can live the life that he's already prepared in advance for you to live. I'm going to just pray that blessing over you. And then here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a couple of songs and we're going to open the altars. I've asked pastors and their spouses along with elders and their spouses to just be available. If you need someone to pray with today, again, this is a moment, and I understand with, with social distancing, we're going to do our best, but here's what I believe. I believe that when Scripture says to pray together, to have pastors and elders lay hands on, I believe in that power still. So they're going to be available for you as we start to sing. As a matter of fact, pastors, spouses, elders, you can start to make your way now even. And then we're going to take a moment. If you want to come and pray with somebody, we're here and available for you. If you want to, if you want to just come and like not talk to anyone, but just kneel or stand and pray at the front, you're more than welcome to. If you want to stand in your seats, if you want to kneel, if you want to sit and just take a moment to say, God, I'm available, you're more than welcome to. We're going to turn this place into a place of prayer. And we're going to get commissioned by God to do what God has called us to do. But remember, it's our movement the faith for our own movement will begin the faith that moves mountains. If you want to receive this today, hold your hands up and I'm going to pray over you. God, today I pray that you see your church, not just a collection of people that, that came here to, to hang out, but a, a collection of people that are on mission with you. That say, God, change our hearts. God, God, speak into our lives, convict our hearts, change whatever needs to be changed to be able to have the righteousness that you've called us to be so that we can walk forward in your strength. And God, today we receive your mission. Let us be people who don't just read all of these amazing stories and think that they're all stories of someone else. But God, let this be a mirror of who we are that when we look into scripture, we see who you've created us to be and we walk with that same strength, that same leadership, that same courage to go be your witnesses in our world. So God, today, as you see us here worshiping in your presence, realize we're here ready to receive what you have for us, to be sent on mission. Allow our movement today, whether it's movement of, of our bodies forward, whether it's movement of our heart, whatever it may be, let our movement today trigger moving, moving of mountains. So God, we give you the praise, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship together, and I encourage you, if you want to come forward for prayer, we're here for you.
grateful to you. We thank you for the altar. We thank you that we have direct access to you because of the sacrifice of your son Jesus. We thank you that there's freedom in that. We thank you for the work that was done here this morning. We thank you that for trials and challenges that we recognize you are already victorious. There is already victory that we are instructed by the love of your word, by your survival guide to leave these things at this altar and to trust you to work it out that it is already done and we walk in that freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you for that reminder that we have an altar in our car, in our bathroom, at the kitchen table, wherever we are, God. You are faithful to meet us there, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, we want to thank you for being here with us this morning. Again, we started out saying we, it's not an accident that you're here. God knew you were coming, and he ignited a fire in our hearts to prepare for you. So we invite you to stop at the Connect Center or take advantage of the link in the description online if you need a Bible, if you need a tool that we call Next Steps. We're here for you. Um, we've got things for you. We love you. Go have a great week. We'll see you next week. Take care.